Well, good morning, everyone, and we're so glad to have you here today in our Bible study. We have been studying from the book of Philippians, and so I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and we have some questions here that we've been looking at as we've been studying. If you'd like to have a set of questions, I have plenty. And if you'll raise your hand, I will bring them around you if you don't have a set. I think most people do, so... Okay, here you go. How many would y'all like over here? Karen, take over. I'll just give you a hand. Yeah. Philippians 2. You got it? Anybody else need one? Alright, I try to make a few extras every week. Just so we won't run. Alright, Philippians chapter 2, and we are in verses 1 through 11 of that chapter. And we've been looking at Paul's letter to Philippi and thinking about the central theme that Paul has stated in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. For to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. And so to live is Christ is what we've been thinking about. And, and the whole book is really centered around that thought. The, the book has a lot to say about Christian joy. And there's, there's a lot to say about Christian joy in the book. But really the book is about Christ and the life that we live as Christ. Christians. And joy is one aspect of that life. And, and joy is important. And we need to have uh, Christian joy within our life. And so as we get into chapter 2, we get into kind of the heart of Paul's thesis to live as Christ. Because in chapter 2, he begins in a very practical way in talking about what our attitudes need to be, and then he goes into why those attitudes need to be that way. And that's what we're going to get into this morning in our Bible study. Let's have a word of prayer together, and then we will begin. Heavenly Father, we praise You and we thank You so much for the night's rest and for... The blessing that it is, Father, to gather together here this morning is your people. We're so thankful, Father, for the love that you have shown us in your Son, Jesus. We're so thankful, Father, for the Word that you have given us. We're so thankful, Father, for that life that Jesus lived and blessed us with by helping us to understand what it means to really be a person created in your image. And help us really to appreciate that and to think about Christ and think about living and, and living our lives as Christians. And, and this statement that the Apostle Paul makes, to live as Christ, help us to really understand that and apply it every day. Father, please forgive us of our sins. We we fall short and, and we beg your mercy and grace. And we ask, Father, that you help us each and every day to, to really fight against sinning against you and, and that you would give us the strength to overcome the temptations that we face in this life. Father, we love you and, and we really want to please you. And we pray that as we worship you this morning, that we would do so. Father, thank You for the land that we live in. And, and we ask, Father, that You would bless this country to elect some good leaders as the coming elections we have. And most of all, Father, that we would continue to have this privilege of being able to worship You without molestation, without having to fear government reprisals and things of that nature. And we, we really pray, Father, that uh, You would uh, protect those freedoms for us. Father, 
we recognize the great blessings that we do have in this nation and, and we pray Father you help us to use those blessings to bless others and not to just think of self all the time but but to really look at our fellow man that's around us who may, who may be in need and to try to reach out to them and to really help them as best we can. Help us, Father, to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked and, and to visit those who are in prison and, and to uh, take Your Gospel to the world around us. There are so many people hurting, Father, and we have a message that can help them. And we just pray, Father, that you help us to take that message to them. Father, be with us in our study this morning. Help us to learn and to grow. And thank you for being patient with us as we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Philippians chapter 2, and last week we, we got through questions 1 through about verse 4, or question 4, 1 through 4, we finished those questions. So we're going to pick up with question 5 this morning on our handout, but let's go ahead and set the context by reading Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 11. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Alright, let's, let's look at uh, verse 4 for just a moment, and discuss that for just a minute before we get into 5 uh, through about verse 8 there. Verse 4 says, let, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now let me, let me put a little thought into your mind here about this verse. I was doing some study on it a couple of weeks ago, and the word interests here is not in the Greek New Testament. Now everybody understands that the... Bible was not written in English, right? It was written originally in Greek. And most people don't read or speak Greek, ancient Greek today. <laughs> so we've got to have translators to translate the Bible for us. And any English Bible is a translation of the Old Testament Hebrew and the New Testament Greek. Okay? So the word interests here is supplied by the translators. And they believe that it clarifies what the Apostle Paul was saying in this verse. And I suppose that there's some clarification there. Uh, there's some idea there. But if you take that word out, interest, if you take the word out, 
I think it makes just as much sense without it. And some translations don't say interests, they say things or something like that. Not his, uh, let each one look out, not look out for his own things, but also for the things of others. I think the King James Version says that. But if you just take out the word things or the, or the word interests and read it like that, I think it makes perfectly good sense. Let each of you look out not only for his own, but also for others. Now, if you look at it like that, if you read it like that, it's a little bit broader, I think. And feel free to comment on this if you'd like. But I think that what Paul is getting at here isn't just other people's interests or things versus our own interests or our own things, but rather it's really a lot more personal than that, okay? When you think about interests or when you think about things, you're sort of objectifying that which people pursue, you know, in their everyday life. But a lot of times, what we pursue more than anything else is self, right? And all the pursuits that we have are just a reflection of what our own desires are and what we seek to fulfill in satisfying self. Okay. Now, contrast that with what Paul says here, and you get a very interesting statement that really does correspond to what he says in verses 5 through 8 about Jesus and what Jesus did. Because Jesus didn't look out for his own. He went to the cross, didn't He? He laid His life down, didn't He? He gave it all up for others. And that's what this statement in verse 5 is reflecting. And verse 5 looks backwards to what Paul has said and it looks forward to what Christ has done as well, okay? So verse 5 is connected. It's right in, it's sandwiched right in the middle. It's, it's the meat between two pieces of bread, so to speak. <laughs> if you'll pardon me that very uh, crude analogy. <laughs> um, but that's what Jesus did. He didn't look out for his own, but he looked out for others. And he laid his life down to prove that that's what he was doing. And so, we ask this question number four, how do we look to the interests of others or how do we look on, the, on others? And then I ask, do we completely forsake our own? Of course, we've got to love ourselves. Now, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 22 and verses 37 and 38, 39, that uh, the first commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like to it, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. All right. So God isn't telling us to uh, abandon self and to really hate ourselves and destroy ourselves or anything like that. That's not what God is telling us. We do have to love ourselves, but we've got to love ourselves like God loves us. All right. That's why the first commandment is to love God first. Okay. Now, if we know how God loves us, then we're going to know how to love ourselves. If we don't know how God loves us, then we're not going to know how to love ourselves. All right? So we do need to love ourselves because if we can't love ourselves, we're not going to know how to love our neighbor because you're supposed to love your neighbor as you love yourself. All right? So, but at the same time, it's not self that we are pursuing. And that's what Paul is talking about here in Philippians 2 and verse 4. Jesus didn't pursue self. He loved himself as God loved him. But he didn't pursue 
self. He didn't pursue self-interest or self-desires or selfishness, if you will. He pursued others. And that's the mind that God wants us to have that verse 5 is talking about here. So we uh, not looking to our own interests or to our own doesn't mean that we have to practice some kind of uh, asceticism. And what I mean by asceticism is, you know, those guys who give up everything, they take a vow of poverty and a vow of chastity and a vow of this and a vow of that. And, vow, and they go out into the desert and they live by themselves, you know, in a monastery or something like that. That's sinful, all right? That's sinful. That's just as selfish as what some of these other things are. Okay? Because in doing that, you're not doing what this verse says to do. That's not really looking out for others. That's just looking out for self is all that is. But that's asceticism. Sometimes it's called asceticism. A-S-C-E-T-I-S-M. Look it up uh, in a dictionary sometime and read about it. And Paul has a lot to say about asceticism in the book of Colossians because some people in the book of Colossians were practicing asceticism. And he said, no, none of that is any good. It's not, not profitable. You shouldn't practice it. Okay? So that's not what Paul is talking about here in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4. He's not talking about asceticism. But what is he talking about? He's talking about loving other people as Christ loved us. That's what he's talking about. And that's what we need to do. We really have to get out and get involved in other people's lives and really love them like God loves them. Now, a lot of times, what we want to do is we want to love them like we want to love them. <laughs> okay? And that's a mistake. That's a big mistake. Because what we're doing when we do that is imposing our own will on their life. And look, it's not going to take long for them to figure that out. All right? But if we love them like God loves us, okay, and we really love people, we really give to them, we really seek to help them, we take them where they're at, we don't judge, and by that I mean we don't condemn them, okay, because we're not the judge, all right? But rather, we accept them and include them and try to work with them, then something, God, God can make something happen with that, okay? Now I won't say that I can make something happen because I'm not the one at work here. God is the one at work. God is the one that's working in us. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3. It's the Lord that works in us, okay? But God can make something happen with that situation. And it is, it is, sometimes it can be surprising. And it is always beautiful to see people really open up and respond to the message of the gospel. <clears throat> but we've really got to reach out to folks around us, not looking out for our own, but also for others. Yeah. So what is, when we get into question number five here, let's just open for discussion. I think I've talked long enough this morning. This isn't supposed to be a lecture, but group discussion, participation. Let's talk about question number five. And, and we've, we've set the stage for answering this question, but let's, let's get it. Let's get your thoughts and just tell me, what is the mind of Christ Jesus that we are supposed to have? Let's talk about that. <clears throat> to do for others. Okay. 
to practice forgiveness within our life. That's a good that's a good point and a good thought because Christ loved people and He really forgave them. Even forgave them when they didn't ask for forgiveness. Did you ever did you ever know that? <laughs> do unto others as we would have them to do uh, unto us, right? Whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, even so do you also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Yes. Yeah, you know, when those uh, two men, or those four men came to Jesus and they had that one man who was uh, uh, sick, couldn't walk, and there was, so, there was this big crowd around the house where Jesus was at. And He was there teaching, and there were a lot of Pharisees and scribes and people gathered there on that particular day. And Jesus was in that house and those men couldn't get in the house and they needed to get in the house to see Jesus. And so they went up on top of the house and they started taking off the uh, the tiles that were up there on the house, started removing them. And uh, the, the, the dirt and stuff that was on top of the house, they just started taking it out. And they were desperate to let this man down into Jesus. And you know, the first thing Jesus says when this man comes down, your sins are forgiven. Wow. They, they weren't there for that. You know that? <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? They didn't come there so that Jesus could say your sins are forgiven. But that's the first thing that Jesus said. Why is that? Why do you think Jesus did that? He gave them what they needed first. He gave them what they needed first. They wanted to say. Yeah. They believed in him enough to know that they could keep the They believed. That's it, man. They believed in him, yes. And they they demonstrated their faith in him when they did the things that they did. Yeah. And that's powerful. Look, if we put our faith and trust in Christ, that's powerful. And Jesus recognizes that. And He responds to that. They knew that they didn't have power within themselves to save themselves. And they needed help. And so Jesus gave them help. He gave them help spiritually. And He gave them help physically. Yeah. But it was about their faith. <coughs> Alright, so how? What is the so forgiveness, that's an excellent point. What is the mind of Christ Jesus that we are supposed to have? Let's keep discussing that. To teach? Okay, tell me what you mean by that a little bit. Okay. Absolutely. We've got to teach the gospel. And we've got to teach about Jesus, don't we? Yeah. We really need to make an effort at doing that. Alright. Yes, ma'am. The mind of a bondservant. The mind of a bondservant. What is that? What is a bondservant? Someone who belongs to somebody else. Personal property. Interesting. Yeah. The word bondservant here is the Greek word doulos. And that is the word for a common slave in this day and time. And so, and so what it says is this. He, made, uh, he took the form of a bond servant. He took the form of a bond servant. Right? And um, in taking that form, what, what is the point of that? Jesus taking the form of a bond servant or of a slave, a common slave. Okay, I, I understand why you're saying that. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, we can talk about that some other time. <laughs> Um, but um, the word the word bond servant we might we might assume from that 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 means well 
uh, a person owes some a lot of money or something like that, and as soon as they pay it back, they won't be a bond servant anymore. But that's not what this word means, okay? This this is the word slave. Alright? And a slave has no freedom. Right? A slave is, is owned. A slave is property, personal property. Okay? So that's a little different than than being the, the concept that you're setting forth there. Okay, yes? He's not free to do what he wants. Come on, you can say it. Sorry. <laughs> He's a servant. Yes, a servant. He's not free to do his will, to do what he wants. That's what you said. He's not serving self. He's not serving self. Right. And that's the heart of what Paul is saying here in verse 4, right? Not looking out for our own, but others. Okay? So, so that's that's a uh, that's a really interesting connection there between this form of a bond servant and this idea. And and that's what it means to have the mind of the, uh, the mind of Christ. All those things that everybody talks about come to pass if we're to follow the great man. Yes. Love. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And um, God is able to make things happen when we really live the way He wants us to live and follow the life, the example that Jesus gave us here. Right? Yes, ma'am. When we think about a, a slave, a slave, like you said, served his master. But the master had a lot of invested in that slave. He didn't want to kill him. He didn't want to have a heat. So there's a lot of thoughts there. Okay, uh, let me just summarize what she said real quick. Uh, started out talking about how that the slave belongs to the master, that the master has invested in the slave, and so he has some interest in there, and that slave wants to do a good job. Um, many, many slaves do want to, uh, in this day and time, they did want to do uh, a good job for the master. They had they had a lot of slaves, and in, in the New Testament had a path to freedom if they would uh, do a good job, because the Roman Empire typically granted slaves their freedom uh, on their thirtieth uh, birthday, and so if they lived to be thirty, then they were usually free, and they became freemen. And, and freemen were that was a coveted uh, title to have um, in in the New Testament period, if you were a slave, all right. So there was there was some hope for them. Uh, so their their culture of slavery was a little different than the culture of slavery that we have in this country, and we don't want to compare those two things together unnecessarily. But nevertheless, um, the point is is that a lot of the slaves wanted to served the masters and wanted to continue with the master even after they ended the slavery and even after they became free. And now something interesting here 
that I want to bring up in relationship to this, and I'll, I'll get to you, Dave, okay, so hang on, um, is what's interesting is, that look, at, look at Galatians chapter 4 for just a moment, okay? Galatians chapter 4 for just a moment, because God doesn't look at us as slaves, okay? <laughs> That's not how He looks at us. Now, Paul is talking about this in the context of serving one another. And I think this is an important point, okay? When we look at one another to serve one another, then yeah, I need to have that mind of I'm going to be your servant. And I'm going to serve you. And I'm not in it for myself, but I'm in it to help you, okay? Completely divesting myself of self when I'm trying to help you. But in relationship to God, God has elevated us, okay? Above the position of servant. He's elevated us to the position of family. Now this happens sometimes in the ancient world, okay? In fact, I haven't seen it yet, but I want to go see the movie Ben-Hur. Have y'all seen the movie Ben-Hur? Has anybody seen it? I need to go see it. Huh? The original. The original, you've seen the original. Well, that's basically the same story. But, you know, in, in the original movie, Ben-Hur, what happens? Ben-Hur, he's uh, a Jew, and he, he uh, ends up getting taken into captivity by a Roman. And then while he's out fighting for the Roman, he saves the, the, uh, the senator's life. And this, what does the senator do? He adopts him as his son. And so he went from being a slave to being family. Okay, now that's that's the message of the New Testament here in uh, Galatians chapter three or Galatians chapter four. Look at what it says. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from what from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we when we were children. Now listen to what Paul is saying here. When we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now he's not talking about the old covenant there, but he is in a sense. But he's not just talking about the old covenant there. He's talking about being in bondage to the, the uh, desires of the world that can control us and throw us around and toss us around all over the place and play with us, okay? And that's what we were when we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But look at verse 4. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. And that's what happened to a slave when he got old enough. He could be redeemed. And you redeemed it. You can redeem yourself from <coughs> slavery by, pay, by paying a price or, or when you got to a certain age. Or the master could redeem you from slavery. Alright? And if the master, now look, if the master redeemed you from slavery, legally, you became part of this family. You became an adopted child. Okay? Now listen to what he says here in verse 5. To redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive what? The adoption of sons. Or children. And because you are children, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a child. Or a son. And if a, if a child, then an heir of God through Christ. So look, we're, in relationship to God, we're not slaves. We're children. Okay? But in relationship to one another, we need to practice servitude. We need to be of service to one another. Okay, And that's what Paul is talking about in uh, Philippians chapter 2. Alright, any other comments? Dave, go ahead. One thing that we can always realize is this bond servant or slave can never free himself. He can never do anything. But it's only the owner, the master, that can do that. And as Paul is discussing here, 
That's God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's right. Now, as, as far as the spiritual situation is concerned, the slave can never free himself. That's exactly right. And because of that, we've got to, to completely depend upon God to do that job for us. Absolutely. And He does it. And He does it through Jesus. Yes, very good point. Very good point. And we've really got to trust Him to do that for us. Absolutely. All right. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? Kevin? Yes. Was Jesus a bond servant to God? Was He a bond servant to God? He was the Son of God. Jesus was the Son of God. And He served God. Okay? He, he was not a bond servant in the sense of... In, in the in the sense that he was owned by God, okay? Even though he was owned by God. <laughs> because God owns everything, alright? But you, you've got to understand what that means, though, okay? God owning everything doesn't necessarily mean that there's no free will, alright? And that's 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 a special thing. Now, when you own, like when you own an object, it doesn't have free will. You can do with it what you want to do with it. Okay. But when you own a person, that's a different situation, right? That person still has free will, and you you can never ever take away his free will. Okay. Doesn't matter what you do. Now you can humiliate him, you can hurt him, you can bring him to the point of death, but you can never take away his free will. It's impossible. Alright? The same thing is true in our relationship with God. God, now, now here's the special thing. God has given us free will. Now he gave Jesus free will too. Alright? And what Jesus did was used His free will to choose to serve God completely. Okay? Now, is that being a bond servant? Maybe. But at the same time, it's not. Because Jesus freely chose everything that he did. Everything. Okay? Now, and that makes, an that makes for an interesting point. Because when you are a servant or a slave, if you freely choose to serve your master, then are you really a slave? <laughs> How about that? Huh? Yeah. That's a good question. Very thoughtful. Anybody else? Any other questions or comments? Well, a lot of times, during this time, people did choose to be slaves. If they were in debt to somebody, they would choose to be a slave of theirs until they paid off the debt. But in our bottom, we being a bond servant in our course, Yes, sometimes people would choose to sell themselves into slavery. If they had a debt of some sort, they could sell themselves into slavery to pay off that debt. And our, yes, what we, and, and the same is true for us in regard to that we have a choice. We have a choice to serve God freely or not to serve God freely. Now, God owns everything. And so God, God still owns us, okay? Because He owns everything. But we can choose to serve Him freely or not. He gives us that choice. And a lot of people labor under the illusion that their life is their own, right? But it's not really. It belongs to God. Every, every single person upon the face of the earth 
belongs to God. Whether they want to or not, they still belong to Him. I have, right. a, I have yes. a question I have <clears throat> rates down from generation to generation. Do you think that our fathers in history saw these examples of slavery and justified that slavery was all right, passed down through generation? Oh, man, Michael, you'd have to ask a question that I can't answer in the last three minutes of class here. I know it's deep. <laughs> I, I'm a, well, I mean, that's... It, I, I'm, just, I'm just teasing. But in my opinion, they had to have got it from the Bible. They no, 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 no. no. Um, they, they used the Bible as rationalization for what they were doing. Okay? But their desires did not come from spiritual desires. Okay, that's what I kind of mean. Is They rationalized by they what they They rationalized did. what they were doing. Their desires were wholly carnal. It was all material. It was based upon their uh, desires to want to well, be enriched. Money. Yeah, greed was behind a lot of it and many other things. But they were all sinful desires that were behind those things. Okay? People have used the Bible to rationalize their sinful desires for years. Absolutely. Now that's that's wrong and that's sinful and God knows everybody who does that and He will He will uh, He will judge them for that. Okay, and they will not have an excuse for doing that. You got a farm right over here in Old Boston, down the road from my house, where a man ran a bunch of them. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, right. I could take you there. It's, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that he hit, that he had. Them. Okay. Any other comments? I want to say that Daddy's Daddy. Well, we're about out of time, but let's just start question number six here and let that kind of percolate in our minds uh, over the next week or so. What is it that Christ did not hold on to or grasp when He came to earth? Now there's a little difference in the translations here. And I think that is important. In verse um, 6, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, and this is the New King James reading, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The American Standard Version of 1901 says, who being in the form of God did not count, it, did not count being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay? So there's two different translations here. I think they both have the same idea in them. They both basically mean the same thing. <laughs> but let's think about that over this next week and go home and do some study on that and then come back prepared to discuss question number six and seven and some more next week. Okay? God bless you. Thank you so much for being here in our class today.